life is a journey, and uh, in terms of why I'm here today, this is where my journey has brought me. Now, each of us has a journey, and that goes from birth to death, hopefully with a lot of good time in between. You know, we hope that uh, our lives turn out well. Uh, sometimes, you know, we hit some potholes along the way, particularly recently in Michigan roads. But, um, you know, the journey is there, and it's where it takes you. Uh, this journey is actually, this is the fifth lecture in a series that um, the Department of Family and Community Medicine has put forth in this conference. Uh, you may have seen the, or been at the um, lectures the other night, Wednesday night, uh, for um, the um, geriatrics grant. This is part of that, too. Several years ago, that's where my journey took me, was to actually uh, work with some other people in writing a grant on geriatrics. It's occurred to me over the years, um, well, let's go back to my training a little bit. I was a psychotherapist before I became a physician. So I was one of those alternative students that um, looked at what was happening and made some decisions in another direction. That took me into a lot more of the mind and spirit rather than the body. And so I had this frustration about not being able to put the body and the mind and the spirit together. And so that led me into osteopathic medicine. Uh, and that was a journey too. Anyhow, several years ago, um, we'd done some grant uh, work at Michigan State on various things. Some of you have probably received our newsletters from our previous project and research. Some of it, um, you may be receiving our newsletters now on the geriatrics piece that we're doing. But this grant is from um, HRSA, Human Resources and Services Administration, and it's a five-year grant with the main um, objective of it to increase the number of geriatricians in the state of Michigan. Uh, one of the things that we found is that there is a shortage of people who want to take care of people who are aging. Some of that, in my estimation, is ageism. You know, um, we hear about racism and, but, um, and we hear about um, feminism and all sorts of isms in terms of our lives and so forth. Well, ageism is somewhat a discrimination against people who, as they are getting older. Well, folks, we're all getting older, and uh, at this point, I have concerns about who's gonna take care of me when I get old enough that I need more care than I need now. So, anyway, this is part of this grant, and it became clear that a lot of our students uh, do not perceive geriatric patients as vital, um, as sexy, as you know, people who still have life to live. And so that was part of going forward with this grant. Now this grant is different because of the fact that um, much of our education in medical school is on the body and how that body works. Now we in the osteopathic profession say that we believe in mind, body, and spirit, but most of us still deal with just the body. Some of us deal with the mind and spirit, but um, not as frequently as we deal with the body. Now that may be our job, uh, but our job at this point is changing because in that life journey, when you come in at birth, um, your parents are there, hopefully, at least one parent to help and guide you, and there are people in your life along the way. Well, we now are faced with the patient-centered medical home. And we essentially are in the position again of becoming parents to our patients. Uh, obviously, we can't meet all of our patients' needs in the same way that uh, hopefully our parents met our needs, but uh, we have this responsibility if, uh, for these reimbursement issues that are coming. So part of this grant is also for us to teach 
some of our medical students and um, our physicians and training residents and hopefully fellows how to uh, bring together uh, other professionals who can also aid us in this process in this patient-centered medical home. So part of our grant has um, worked with nurse practitioners and social workers and PAs and uh, each of them playing different roles in the healthcare strategy as we go forward to try and deal with this. One of the things that uh, has come with the patient-centered medical home that we've done some experience uh, and experimenting with is the group visit. Much of what I'm going to talk about today, the educational part of the medical visit, uh, which is uh, reimbursable, uh, can deal with um, wellness and the concepts of wellness. As you all know, at this point, Medicare pays for a wellness exam on a yearly basis. Now, any group visit has to also have a medical component to it, but you know, we look at new strategies of how we can begin to uh, capitalize in what we are now held accountable for as physicians. So anyway, um, my journey this morning, sometimes I do digress, and so this uh, PowerPoint that I, I have in front of me is kind of my map for today. Nobody gives us a map at birth. Again, we get guidance, and nobody gives us a map along the way. We sometimes take detours and find ourselves having to go back. Um, that is kind of how this uh, presentation this morning may go. So uh, bear with me here. I'm going to try and go through a number of things, some dealing with the mind and spirit, a few dealing with the body as well, because they are interrelated. Okay, first I'm going to define the philosophy of optimal aging for you. I'm going to compare that philosophy uh, with osteopathic medicine principles and also with something called successful aging. Um, I'm going to describe the determinants of optimal aging, the components of it, and then some of the positive and negative attitudes that affect our health. First, optimal aging is the capacity to function across many domains, physical, functional, cognitive, emotional, social, and spiritual, to one's satisfaction and in spite of one's medical conditions. Um, this concept first was being developed by Bates and Bates, later Walsh in company with um, Kenneth uh, Brummel Smith, uh, MD, uh, came forward with this. Um, largely what I'm doing today is talking about some of the work that uh, Kenneth Brummel Smith, MD, went on to do. Uh, I met Dr. Brummel Smith a few years ago and actually chatted with him about this. And, you know, I told him about the grant that uh, I was doing, and at that point he was thrilled. He said, Oh my goodness, you know, we need to introduce our uh, physicians to much more of this type of philosophy as they go along. And he was thrilled that I was doing that with medical students. Now, osteopathic medicine. This is probably my favorite quote of um, um, A.T. Still, and that is, to find health should be the object of the doctor. Anyone can find disease. And so, you know, my goal over the years is to live up to this and actually find health in my patients because patients need hope. And if you give them hope in terms of finding some type of um, way of going forward in their situation, you know, they may feel really bad about what has happened to them, but if you can show them that they can get past some of these issues that are happening in their life um, and they can make accommodations and you can show them ways to go forward uh, with maybe an apparatus that they didn't know existed or a group that they can get support in. All of those things are part of treating the mind and the spirit as well as the body. In the principles of osteopathic medicine, Osteopathic medicine views the human being as a unit of body, spirit, and mind. Now, each of you has heard that 
and um, integrates it into your lifestyle as best you can. Uh, the key points are structure and function, are interrelated or integrated. Now this comes from multiple authors and I did actually a paper when I was a health policy fellow on the distinctiveness of osteopathic medicine and whether it's still there. Now it looked to me when I was trying to write this grant, which optimal aging is the, the actual meat of the grant and all of the both medical uh, units and uh, modules that we are developing all of them have a space on the side in the curriculum for um, the optimal aging piece that um, this satisfies. So that we try all through our development of the physical medicine modules as well as the mind and spirit modules to go forward with the thought that body, spirit, and mind need to be treated integrally in in uh, working with our patients, uh, but we also need to keep reinforcing that to our medical students and to our residents, to our fellows, and as I look around, some of our physicians could use a refresher course in mind and spirit as well. Now, the human being has self-regulatory me mechanisms and is able to defend and heal itself. That is the part sometimes where mind and spirit comes in the most handy. And that is that you can treat the body, but if this spirit and mind is wounded by the things that have incurred to their body, something has to take place that takes them forward to going and making a decision in terms of life and death. Because clearly, we all know that we have encountered patients that have you know, serious, serious disease, but somehow they have some hope. They want to make it to their daughter's wedding. They want to make it to their grandson's graduation. There are things in their life that they have hope about, things in their life that they want to do before they're willing to just lay down and die. And so, you know, those are the, the kinds of things that enter into both optimal aging and into osteopathic medicine. When the normal homeostasis of the human being is altered, then this becomes susceptible to disease and treatment must occur. We all know also that over the years there are patients who have extreme worry that things have happened to them, things that they can't seem to get past. Then, you know, that affects their immune system. We know that the immune system protects us. We know that going forward, that people who just don't have that feeling of wanting to live, wanting to go forward, um, are much more susceptible to having other things happen to them. Now, successful aging, I have a little difficulty with. It sounds similar, but um, nobody is really absent uh, of disease or disability. With aging, we know that most patients who are 55 and older, maybe in many cases 65, uh, have at least one chronic disease, whether that be hypertension, hyperlipidemia. Um, one of those things is usually present somehow, so they're really not absent of disease. They may have a high cognitive and physical functioning level, um, and they may be actively engaged with life, but um, successful aging doesn't take into some of these other considerations. If you go back to optimal aging, it, it deals with in spite of one's medical condition. And so I think it goes a little bit forward. Now, optimal aging and uh, osteopathic medicine seemed very compatible to me. And that was part of the reason I went forward with this as the central theme of, of this grant process. Um, in optimal aging, oh, one of the other things I want to say is that much of what I'm going to present today is uh, actually evidence-based. There are a lot of studies. Sometimes I will put the, the study on this whole thing um, on the PowerPoint to remind me. But uh, at the end, I actually have referenced the two articles 
uh, by Ken Brummel-Smith um, that deal with a lot of this, and there's a lot of this information in that. And so that is what I used um, in my grant to go forward. Anyway, optimal aging takes into consideration function. Some of us function better than uh, other people in terms of our physical body. Um, so you, you have to take into consideration what kinds of things um, that you're willing to do. You know, we were on a recent trip to uh, Puerto Rico and uh, this was part of the AOA mid-year meeting and I looked at the activities that were offered and I said to myself, now that sounds like a real lot of fun, but is that really something I want to do? And so I um, kind of passed on a couple of the activities. Uh, some of our other folks didn't and we had a few injuries. Um, but uh, I didn't go zip lining. Uh, I, you know, it sounded like a lot of fun, but I just didn't think that I wanted to take the chance. I knew I had a lot of stuff coming up in my life that, so some of this is personal decisions based on what you know is your function. Um, in terms of disease, as I said, you know, most patients as they age uh, have at least one chronic disease. Um, clearly, how well they function depends on their social environment support system, um, the physical environment in which they're living. Probably the biggest thing is genetic endowment. You know, we get a lot from our parents and we know that we're living longer than the people before us because of the miracles of modern medicine. Um, I think that we, however, can do things to uh, circumvent our own genetic in, uh, endowment with what we do as far as function and exercise and some of the other pieces. And we've seen people die earlier than their parents um, because of what they've chosen uh, in their lifestyle. Uh, always individual response and your ability to adapt is probably the thing that is strongest in, in terms of going forward with some of your decisions. Clearly the healthcare system affects us greatly in terms of making our living, in terms of what it does to our patients. There are patients who have no clue what's going on at this point. Um, and you know there are many of us who have no clue at this point where we're going next with all of the changes that are happening. So, uh, back to optimal aging. The biological portions of this uh, deal with exercise, nutrition, sleep. So you, can, you can read this as well as I, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Functional deals with strength, balance, flexibility, and conditioning. And I've kind of allocated this to the body in terms of, of how I view it and how I prepared to talk to you today. In terms of the, the components of optimal aging that deal more with mind and spirit, those are the social and the things uh, that support us. Um, our activities, work, volunteerism, sexuality, religion, spirituality. The psychological definitely has a place here with attitude, viewpoint, uh, the amount of stress that we're dealing and our ability to adapt and be resilient in those situations. Societal, you know, we have some control over. We haven't had much control in terms of our legislature at this point. Uh, not much is getting done in Washington. And so when you look at that, we're all affected by what actually is out there. I do want to share with you that part of our grant process has been to work with the Office of Aging Services with the governor's office. And so I actually have been an, a bit of an advisor to them um, on some of these issues. They are thrilled with the fact that we are doing this grant work and they're very excited about the possibility that medical students are learning about geriatrics and may come to appreciate um, geriatric patients more. Now, this is one of the examples. This is Eleanor Heinemann. She's age 80. She started doing karate at age 78. She says it makes her mentally sharp. She got a gold medal and she's a purple belt in karate. Our aging population, uh, at this point, we know that the baby boomers are aging and many of you in this room uh, fit that category. 
Um, there are 13% of our population that is currently above 65, and the group that is above 85 is the fastest growing segment of the population. There are more 85-year-olds alive today than ever before in the history of man. Florida has the largest percentage of older persons. California has the greatest number. Uh, Michigan is eighth. We also, uh, at this point, know that uh, many of the Michigan folks that have gone off to retire in Florida, California, Texas, um, North Carolina, many of them are coming back. Often, um, they've, their partner has died. They're coming back to be with their children. And so we have a growing population in Michigan of folks that are definitely Okay, this is one of those diversions on the map, so um, we'll see where this one goes, so you may not get to hear all of this, we'll see. Anyway, uh, we know there's an increasing percentage of older persons happening all over the world. We're expected to see this peak by 2050. Um, in terms of culture, one of the things that we find in you know, the culture of the United States is that people kind of get thrown away after they reach a certain age. Their wisdom is not valued. Um, some of their life experience and things they've done are not valued. And uh, that's different in some other cultures, particularly, you know, in China and some of the other places where older people are revered for their wisdom. Um, that's part of what I want to try and do too, is keep that, um, that history of those folks who came before us and uh, who have tried to teach us some of these lessons of life. Now, here we have Helen. Helen deadlifted 245 pounds. I don't know about you, but I can't do that. Uh, she once competed in a men's 35-year and older bracket, and because there were no other women, she won. <laughs> Good for Helen. Now, life involves challenges and opportunities, and um, I'm going first with the body piece uh, because it's the most familiar. These are the things that happen to your body as you age. You get impairment in your taste or smell, impaired vision, multiple medications that you take that uh, give you multiple side effects, cognitive deficits. How many times have you said, no, why was I looking to go into this room? <laughs> and you, you um, later remember and go back and get what you um, had planned to get in the first place. But that happens to all of us. You can call them senior moments or you can call them brain farts or whatever you want to call them. But it happens to us more and more as we age. And it's, a, it's multiple factors that cause that. Certainly, um, we know that uh, swallowing is more difficult. Dr. Whiting talked about that the other night and some of the things you can do. There are more issues with stomach and intestinal diseases because of decreased ga gastric emptying. Um, and then we deal with some of these issues as we go older and um, all of us are gonna die. You know, we just hope that we can put it off and live in the best situation possible until we get to that point. And I, I guess, you know, I often think of some of the things I heard when I was younger, when people told me, if I knew I was gonna get this old, I would have taken much better care of myself. And so that is what optimal aging is about too, uh, is trying to do the best you can in the situation and to get enough wisdom along the way to make that happen. Now, in terms of the functional things, we know that there are manual dexterity problems, mobility limitations, an increased risk of fall. Again, Dr. Whiting addressed this the other night in terms of the changes in gait and, um, and the changes of the body as we age. 
Um, incontinence becomes a real issue, and his philosophy is, is continence is not a normal piece of life. So uh, those are things that hopefully can be altered. Now in terms of preserving the body, there are a lot of things we know, and these are indeed evidence-based. Um, uh, listening to the speaker yesterday, he said saturated fats are uh, becoming um, more indicated in some situations. I, the evidence that I'm using at this point says that we should replace those saturated fats with, and trans fats with unsaturated fats. Substituting whole grain for refined grain uh, makes perfect sense from the standpoint that so many of our population are diabetic at this point. And again, substituting nuts, beans, chicken, and less fatty sources such as chicken and fish for red meat um, certainly are considerations. But I still like my red meat and, um, and so I choose to have it some of the time. In terms of eating nine servings of uh, vegetables and fruit per day, uh, most of us don't do that. I was uh, somewhat impressed last night listening to Dr. Rosick when he said that when you look at the population of the U.S., 50% um, of the fruits and vegetables that are taken in are potatoes, ketchup, and iceberg lettuce. So. Um, we all can improve somewhat in terms of that. Using alcohol in moderation has been shown in some cases to be a life-preserving thing. Taking a multivitamin has become you know, much more on the surface of things. And if you think that 50% you know, of the population are eating potatoes, iceberg lettuce, and ketchup, you know, this is probably not a bad idea. As far as uh, poor nutrition and weight loss, we begin to associate that more in, as people age with excess mortality, frailty, and loss of quality of life. Um, the estimation is that about uh, in patients above the age of 65, about 30% of them are considered frail. They obviously need different treatment, but that says that 70% are not frail and those are places we can make a difference, um, and we can make it somewhat of a difference in the frail, depending on what we do. Um, again, we know that uh, nutritional interventions play a major role in disease management, and um, have been shown to limit the progress of disease by eating nutritiously, doing some of the other things in life that make a difference, but good food is one of the big things to try and prevent um, further um, decrease in weight loss uh, during experiences with disease. That's a common happening. We know also that dietary interventions can make a difference in terms of macular degeneration, stroke, heart attacks, lipid abnormalities, and many other um, of the diseases that begin to affect us as we age. Exercise is the single most important health-promoting activity a person can engage in. I'm saying that slowly because it's one of the things that a lot of us um, don't get to. Uh, I personally have tried to make a commitment and I did my exercises before I came here this morning, so I want to try and be an example. But some is better than none. Uh, the recommend, recommendation is for 30 minutes at once a day. Um, sometimes I get that in, sometimes I don't, sometimes I do more. Um, but if you can encourage your patients to do something, something is better than nothing. Again, maintaining a healthy body weight um, is certainly important. Sleep is one of those things that is really important because of the hormonal changes that occur in our body when we don't get enough sleep. And um, I can attest to the fact that there are some mornings that um, I've been up late at night or I'm headed to that 7 a.m. meeting and it just really is difficult. Um, so I try and do that with sleep much more than I used to. As far as alcohol, um, it, we go back and forth on this, uh, whether it's healthy or unhealthy. 
Um, there's been a new study that came out, I haven't read it, saying that um, any alcohol is detrimental. Um, but as you know, the study of the week gets publicized in the media. And unless you really go back and read you know, what they studied, how many people were in the study, you re really don't know. We do know, however, that tobacco is the single most important disease-causing sub substance to avoid. And I work with my patients on this all the time. You know, sometimes I'm successful, sometimes I'm not. You know, um, with some of my male patients, I share a personal story. And, you know, some of you may have heard this, some of you may not. When I met my husband um, and we were dating, he was smoking three packs of cigarettes a day. And um, he always had a cigarette in his hand. And I really liked him, but the smoking bothered me, and I let him know, and I told him, you know, it really isn't good for your health to smoke. And he said, well, you got to die of something. And so what I said at that point is, well, you know, I'm, I was in my training at this point at Lansing General, and, you know, I was seeing all these folks who came in with end-stage COPD. We used to actually refer to some of them as anaerobes, because they actually had blue skin and you know they had sometimes a CO2 that was higher than their O2. Um, and sometimes they were on a vent for a while and many of them you know, were essentially unable to carry out life in much way other than um, roll their oxygen tank and, and some of them still smoked while they, outside while they, um, were trying to uh, be in the hospital and get better. So anyway, I said, well, you know, not everybody gets uh, lung cancer, and that's, you know, that happens pretty quickly, and, and you die quickly, but pretty much everybody gets COPD. And, you know, I said, if you're on oxygen and you can barely breathe, you can't have sex. And, you know, he thought about that, and, um, we went on a trip together and he put his cigarettes in the back of the airplane seat and never smoked again. And so people can do this, they just need some kind of motivation. For him, sex obviously was the motivation. Um, it's not the same for everybody else, but um, you know, uh, if you can find something to talk with your patients about that you know, you, you give them enough information, sometimes you can make a difference. Um, recommendations for use of prophylactic aspirin are changing um, in the new beers cr um, criteria for uh, the elderly. Um, it is not appropriate in some cases uh, that aspirin be given, so not everybody should be on aspirin because of the increased risk of bleeding that can occur uh, in elderly as a uh, result of falls and other situations and, and in relationship to their other medications. Clearly, it's still indicated in those that have suffered an MI uh, or may have uh, clear indications that they will at some point. Avoiding or reducing stress. Now, this is an easy one, folks. You know, all of us are under stress. You know, it. It's everywhere. If you, you know, listen to the news, I guarantee you by the end of it, you'll be in stress. If you read what you're expected to do by October 1 with having an electronic medical record, at least we got the reprieve from ICD-10 for a while. But all of us have to figure out in our life how we can reduce stress. Because I have no patients that come into the office that that don't tell me that they have stress of one sort or another. So, um, the things that we know can make a difference, exercise being the first one, um, certainly meditation, breathing exercises, Tai Chi, those are the non-medication uh, kinds of things that, that we need to think about both for ourselves and for our patients because stress isn't going to go away, and, it, and it, it's not ever going to be easy. I was being facetious before. Avoiding or reducing depression. Now, when I was a psychotherapist, you know, somebody, um, and I can't remember where this came from, but um, 
It's something I've always remembered. Depression is anger that you turn inward. And anger is everywhere. You know, there, if you look again, there is so much anger in the world and people are not dealing with it well. Um, many people at this point, rather than be angry, you know, uh, bring that inside and then they become depressed because they feel like they can't do anything about their anger. So part of what depression, if you think of it as anger, um, what you can try and, and engender in your patients is to actually express that anger in some form that is positive, whether it be going to a group, talking with other people, you know, just sitting down and screaming in their own house with the windows closed and the door closed and hitting a pillow. You know, all of those things, exercising, you know, all of those things make a difference. And we know that exercise for, for sure can improve uh, depression. We see much different levels of hormones, the hormones that again affect the immune system in relationship to depression. Now, again, preserving the body, do some exercise for 30 minutes a day, never use an elevator or escalator uh, when stairs are available, walk or bike on errands that would take less than 10 minutes, don't use re uh, remote control devices, use manual devices when you can. These are recommendations uh, from Dr. Brummelsman. In terms of um, improving balance, some of these are kind of interesting. Um, engage in exercise that requires balance. Uh, tai Chi is one of those things. Dancing, I have patients who do square dancing. Some like to do ballroom dancing. And believe me, as somebody who is uh, occasionally trying to learn to dance, um, it does take balance, you know, uh, and it is something that can improve that. If you're working and standing somewhere, this is a new one and I hadn't thought about it, but just stand in tandem, put one foot in front of the other and see if you can balance. Some days it's easier than others. Uh, try heel to toe walking for short distances and uh, again stand up and sit down on chairs using one leg so that you indeed you know, try and increase your um, your quad strength. Um, those are some of the things that we see that go quickly. Stairs is another interesting situation. Uh, climbing stairs will also do that in relationship to uh, your quads and your hamstrings. So uh, the better you can maintain that leg strength. Now these, um, again, you can use small weights or you can use the can of vegetables or whatever can and you can use that as a weight. Um, you can uh, do the standing to sitting exercises while watching TV up and down. Um, and again, health club is a, is a thing that some people can do financially and some people can't. But most people have cans of something in their cupboard and you can also put these in um, plastic bags and use them as weights for your feet. In terms of the challenges of mind and spirit, some of these are a little harder. Um, again, depression, dementia, bereavement, substance abuse, pre-death concerns. Obviously, you know, there are lots of reasons to be depressed in life. And so, you know, telling people to snap out of it isn't going to work. Um, at, you can ask them to exercise. You can ask them to get with other people in a group and sometimes um, talking about you know, your situation makes it better. There are medications that can be used, but again, in the uh, people who are above a certain age, they start to act differently. So uh, clearly dementia is something that needs to be diagnosed. We have medications now, but we know that preventive is somewhat um, helpful in this situation. Bereavement, people are gonna die. People in your life are going to die, people in my life are going to die, you know, and you have to make the decision that you're going to go on. You may need to seek help with um, those feelings with someone else, but um, it's a part of life, you know, death is a part of life. 
As far as substance abuse, um, alcohol is fairly common as a way of dealing with pain. Um, and all of us, as we age, generally have more in the way of pain. Um, it, you know, we know that um, acetaminophen, as Dr. Pascucci said, is now considered the main uh, treatment for osteoarthritis. Um, there are medications that can be used over the counter. The biggest things, you know, many of um, our patients want to have a pill to swallow you know, to make it better. And there is no magic pill, we all know that. There is no magic wand, you know, and so we need to do the best we can with that. Dealing with death is something that we all have to do and we have to figure out, you know, how we wanna do that and um, under what circumstances. In the social situation, um, as you get older, many of the people, um, that you used to know either moved away um, because of retirement um, and you know as you retire you can become more isolated um, if there are uh, moves away from home these are stressors uh, again some of my medical education back a long time ago uh, told me that if you move somebody four times they die um, and so, you know, you look at the trips that patients take between nursing homes and hospitals and back again and from their home and um, so you begin to see um, that this changes their life and if you're unable to adapt to new circumstances and change is difficult for you, sometimes you just say, I can't do this anymore. So it's important to try and have an attitude about whatever your situation is. Fear becomes a greater thing, particularly in inner city areas and during these tough ec economic times, you know, where uh, there's less money to go around. Uh, and that's generally true in retirement, that um, you thought you saved more than you did and um, you find that life is changed and you can't do the same things that you did before. Poverty, um, I doubt that anybody in this room is going to experience true poverty, but um, you know, certainly many of our patients do and it's a difficult thing to deal with. Um, in the opportunity I've had with the offices of, of uh, services for the aging, um, they actually have uh, developed networks of community resources that you can access and those are available if you check on their way, website, um, which is, um, I haven't got it on here, but um, it is one of the .gov sites and if you go to the Michigan.gov, they are there and um, they have information numbers that you can call or that you can have your patients call. Certainly the societal uh, issues, lack of resources, increasing chronic disease, uh, poor self-management training. Again, some of the things that are here are things that you can use in a group situation and train your parents or patients. You do not have to do it yourself but you need to be, at least be aware of it and, and communicate it to your team of, of professionals in your office so that um, some of these things can be accessed for your patients. One of the things that's new on the scene, at least for us, is uh, care managers. And the care managers who have been helping us in the clinic have been very um, helpful in sorting out what kind of community resources uh, might be available to help some of the people who have more needs. Okay, uh, back to promotion of uh, cognitive health for the body and the mind. Take a multivitamin, engage in multi uh, uh, mentally stimulating activities, remain socially engaged, exercise um, has been shown for both the body and mind to make a difference even if it's just a little a day. Um, again, reduce stress, relaxation exercises, yoga, tai chi, meditation, um, and again, avoid or reduce depression and get adequate sleep. 
In terms of preserving the mind and the spirit, we know that a positive attitude towards life improves health. Uh, we know that in people that remain positive about their lives, um, despite whatever seems to be happening, that they develop fewer risk factors, they have fewer negative events, and uh, they actually recover faster from uh, difficulties that they may have. A specific philosophy uh, is uh, presented by Wood in his article in 2010, where he found that feeling great uh, gratitude or appreciation for things in your life have made a significant difference. It is associated positively to well-being, um, to positive, uh, positive emotional function, positive social functioning, less anger and hostility in the life, debt, less depression, and a higher success in life activities. Um, it's easy to be negative. Um, if you listen to many of the conversations in, um, in situations when you talk with other physicians, um, we have a lot to feel negative about, but we have a lot to feel positive about. So if you take the, the path that says, I'm going to try and be as positive as I can in my life about whatever is happening, that makes a difference for you. It goes to increased longevity, reduce, reduced morbidity, increased cognitive flexibility, improved memory. It also uh, improves decision making, creativity and innovation problem solving, improved job performance and achievement, improved clinical problem solving. Now, preserving the spirit. The one thing I was sitting back there thinking um, that I had left out this, um, but probably the number one thing um, is hope. You know, um, hope has to do with all of these things, but each of us needs to have a certain amount of self-esteem to feel like we've accomplished something in our lives, to feel like we've done something for others. Um, and if you have personal goals for your future, you know, many people um, look to their time of retirement as, oh, it's, this is going to be so wonderful when I retire. Well, life changes, you know. Um, what you thought retirement was going to be when you were 30 or 40 and looking forward to it, you know, has now changed because of lots of circumstances. But you can sit and you can reevaluate. One of the things I did when I was a residency director uh, a long time ago is I would make my residents actually do a plan. And I would have them tell me where they wanted to be in a year, in three years, in five years. I would ask them what procedures they wanted to do by the time they finished their residency, what kind of practice they wanted to have. And so we then de developed a learning plan based on that, um, that decision. I actually told them, have a fantasy. Tell me what you want your life to be like. And I guess that's, a, that's something I've done with my own life, is that I will sit and have a fantasy about where I want to be in 10 years, 20 years, and so forth. Um, and I don't always get to those places, but what I try and do in that situation is say, okay, this is where I want to be. What do I have to do to get there? What kind of training do I need? What kind of, of uh, thought process do I need? What kind of plan do I have? And this works at any age, so that if you sit down and have a fantasy and say, okay, um, I think I'm going to live for a long time. Um, what do I want to be doing at this point in my life? And you put down on a piece of paper what steps it takes to get there, what things that you have to do, and then you keep that. And you look at it periodically, and you decide if you're on that road or if you diverged, and maybe you need to alter it a little bit and rethink it. But if, if you have a plan, you may have some sense of where you want to go. It's sort of like a map. But um, 
you know, none of us gets that um, for ourselves, so we have to figure out how to develop it. Probably a belief in something larger than self. I find that people as they age who say they don't believe in God um, actually find more of that as they age and realize that they want to believe that there's something after life. Now, I don't necessarily talk religion to my patients, but many people believe in the universe, many people believe in humanity. There needs to be something out of yourself bigger than you that, that folds into a sense of belief about what it is that may happen to you in the future. Uh, again, the ability to adapt to new and changing circumstances pr is probably one of the most important things. You know, it is hard to change. It's hard to accept new things. But the, the more you can talk to yourself and tell yourself that this too will pass and there is a way of getting through this, the, the stronger you become in going forward. A belief that you are important to others and the world. We all want to leave some kind of legacy, whether it be to our grandchildren, our, our children, to um, people that are important to us, to our um, husbands, significant others, etc. Um, and so think about that and decide what it is that you want to do. Seeking happiness and joy for oneself and others. This is probably, again, a very important thing because God knows there is so much sadness that we can feel. And if we only feel sadness, that really affects us in terms of how we are willing to go forward. So we need to look at what little things we can do for ourselves to create happiness and joy and what things we may be able to do for others. Those give you uh, a more positive spiritual orientation. Desire to live one's life to the fullest. Hey, you know, if there's something you want to do, figure out how you can do it. I'm going to live without having gone zip lining, but there are, you know, other things in my life that I still want to do, you know, there are places I want to visit. And so I need to make that happen. You know, there are some things that, and that's one of my favorite sayings, well, I don't need to do that um, it, before I die. Um, and whether you call that a bucket list or whether you call it something else, figure out what things are really important to you, but also have your patience do it. Again, we all need to make peace with the fact that life does not last forever. And, you know, we need to look at, you know, what things we regret, what things that we've done that we would like to have changed. We can't go back and change them, but there are people that have hurt us and hurt each other and that we've hurt. And so sometimes, making apology um, if you feel the need to do that or making an effort to, um, to ha try and reconnect with someone that you've had difficulties with in the past. You know, you don't have to ever like them, you don't have to spend the rest of your life with them, but you know, somehow you, know, you get closure in a situation by giving forgiveness and giving apology or finding a bit of relief in creating less discord that you have to think about from what you've lived through. So these are a few of the things. This is more an attitude or philosophy that I think, you know, as I said, fits with osteopathic medicine. These are some of the things that we're trying to teach our medical students um, early. I wish you know, I had learned some of this earlier, but I do, you know, I did come into medical school with a different background, uh, and, and I did get some of this through when I worked with people as a psychotherapist. So anyway, there's a lot here, and uh, at this point, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Oh, uh, excuse me, I need to show you Ada Thomas. 
Um, she started jogging at age 65, did her first marathon at 68, and she said, when I look in the mirror, I like what I see. And that's what I want for each of you and for myself, is when I look at that mirror, that I like what I see. And these are the references I told you about to Ken Brummelsmith's work. So, anyway, your question, sir. Right. Well, the question or, or the statement is in regard to much of this uh, may need to begin in childhood, and I totally agree with that. Optimum aging doesn't begin as um, at 55 or 65. Some of these concepts definitely apply to um, our younger generation. Unfortunately, in the school situation, some of it is money-driven, and there are not the kinds of programs there were um, we, back in the 60s, uh, we had the Kennedy initiatives uh, that wanted everybody to have exercise programs and that actually came into the schools. Now, um, I will say that not everyone who is a parent um, supports the uh, athletic kinds of events or the uh, physical education kinds of events. And so there are a lot of things that um, that actually affect that. If you listen to some of our folks who work on pediatric obesity and so forth, they are trying to get some of those things changed. Um, and whether that'll happen or not, you know, some of it is financially driven, some of it is personally driven, but yes, I think we should encourage all of our um, young patients to actually get started on an exercise program too. Because if you um, don't use it, you do lose it. Other, yes. Carol, two, just comments. Two of them. Uh, one is that before bucket list became, you know, talked about, talking with patients about plans for the future, where they're going, and to try to make up the list of what they'd like to do, gives them more purposeful life. I have a patient both diagnosed with ovarian cancer stage four and six. One was your purpose of life for those four months, the other four and a half years. The will to keep going is desire to make a huge difference. The second one is uh, suicide, really common in this age group. And what I have been doing was sending the patient with cancer to the oncologist, radiologist, radiation therapy, and uh, had lost touch with them. And the more I lost touch, the higher my suicide rate went on. It's really important to continue to see these people to nurture them mentally. Absolutely. Um, it, all of those things are important, and thank you for sharing those. Any other um, comments people want to make or questions? If not, thank you very much for your kind attention.